same on your screens, but I've got Paul Bur Burston on my right, uh, Neil Broadford um, in the middle, and uh, Val VG Lee yeah. uh, right next to me. Welcome, everybody. Um, I was going to say, I mean, this is a kind of excuse to talk to writers about what we're doing during these strange times of lockdown. And before I get going, in case I forget, I just want to mention a couple of other things that are going on. Um, tonight at eight, Mark Edwards has shamelessly ripped me off and will be talk he's starting up his own Facebook Live. And he's talking to Callie Taylor, who happened to be on my thing a couple of weeks ago, actually. Um, but they're both very entertaining people. So please go. I think he's called Mark Edwards Writer or Mark Edwards Author on Facebook. Please go to that. Uh, and the very lovely people who run Theakston's said, um, could I mention a couple of hashtags on Twitter? They're planning to do a virtual festival because obviously you heard that um, Theakston's this year was closed uh, was because of the virus, but they're going to go and do some stuff online. They want me to mention a couple of hashtags, which are HIF player and HIF at home. And they're looking for other suggestions of other people they can do. Let me just try and put those on screen somewhere. Um, and those hashtags is worth looking. So if you've got suggestions of people you'd like to see at the Harry, at um, I think I think what they're up to. I've only just started following it myself, so I'm a little behind. But um, anyway, please please welcome my writers and and Neil. Hello. Um, you apart from having a book out last week, you're also going to be on an event tomorrow. Can you tell us a bit about that before we get going? Yeah, it's one of these virtual noir at the bars that are the brainchild of Vic Watson, Elementary V Watson. Um, so there's been a kind of series of them. And we're doing them um, via Zoom, which everybody has become experts over in the last four weeks. And there's going to be a plethora of writers along with myself. I will get my notes up and I will tell you some of the other writers that are there. It's going to be myself, Trevor Wood, Eve Smith, Louise Mangos, Rob Parker, Effie Merrill, at Martin Siegel, CJ Merritt, um, Simon Berwick, DLM Wright, and a few others. So we're doing that uh, tomorrow night. There was one... Now, I want to say, I think there was one last week, and they seemed to go really well. And it's it was, yeah, it was great. Um, and I'd just like to say hello, Hugo from Norway, which is great, and, and Sven from Germany. We're going, we've gone international today. Um, so, yeah, um, thanks very much. And, Neil, as I said, you got a book out last week. What classic timing to be releasing a novel. Yeah, that, it, was, it was one of those ones where we had everything set up, and I was meant to be doing all these events you know the usual thing where you go around the country and you go and speak to bookshops and events and had some authors lined up i think that i'm kind of responsible for the lockdown because it seems that every time i try and organize something with tony ken the world conspires against me to make sure it doesn't happen and we had this great event sorted out oh my dad's just turned up andy hill hi andy um basically um i had an event sorted out with tony for london and then the lockdown came and everything just went dead but one of the interesting things is that the way that, as we're doing just now, publishers and writers are adapting to the fact that we're living in this virtual world and they're pushing everything online. So they've managed to do great guns of pushing stuff online, serializing the book in my old paper, which has been putting out the links every day, um, doing a lot of online interviews, a lot of blogs, um, doing a blog tour with a lot of the bloggers. And it's been really interesting to see how, even though it's been something that you would have thought it's killed a book dead, I've got some of the best publicity and the widest scale publicity I've had because we've had to think our way around it. So it's been an interesting week. I think it's exceptional. I think it's really brilliant. I think everybody in the chain from bookshops to publishers are actually having to think very hard about, about how they make things work. Your book's called No Place to Die, I should say, because I don't think we really have the title yet. Look, beautiful cover. Very very well. cover. They have very done well. a really good job with this one. It's a cracking, a cracking cover. Just hope the words live up to it. Of course they and will. Um, <laughs> Thank you. It's set in, um, who's your dad again? Yeah. <laughs> Nobody's cut my hair yet, Dad, okay? That's going to happen after this. I must apologise. I've got lock in here because I, I was due a haircut just before this all kicked off. I had no idea about the relationship there. Um, but um, this is the second book in a series yes. that's set in Stirling in Scotland, which is another place that is dear to the hearts, like as with Harrogate and as with Bristol, or whatever, it's very dear to the hearts of crime writers. Yeah. Why did you set up a series in Stirling? Because I was in Stirling at Bloody Scotland um, and I just had the idea. I was up at the, right, that's it. Tony's just mentioned it. So <laughs> my tribute to an 80s television detective is now going on and will stay on for the duration. Thanks, Tony. Um, name the TV series. Leave that one for later on. 
Um, yeah, I was at Stirling, I was at Bloody Scotland, and I was watching the football match up at the top of the town. Um, and while I was there, me being me, I suddenly had this idea of, this would be a great place to dump a body. And then somebody kicked a ball, and I thought, even better, this would be a place to dump a decapitated body. Oh, something in that. And I just went for a walk around Stirling, and it was one of those things that we get where once you have one idea, the other ideas just start coming. So I started to think, oh, I could dump a body there. I could kill somebody there. I could do this. I could do that. Oh, this is great. And nobody's ever written about Sterling. And that was it. Um, and me being me, I didn't plot. I didn't plan. I just had that first thought in my head of, right, there's a decapitated body. Why is there a decapitated body? Who's going to look into it? And I just followed it from there. And then 100,000 words later, um, No Man's Land was born. I love this thing that, you know, I always assume, you know, I presume we've got four writers in, in the rectangle. I assume that everybody thought like this, that if you're at a football match and you suddenly think, well, that'd be a good place to be a de dead body and your brain starts spiraling out. Works very well with empty houses. I find if you walk past an empty house, yep. any writer is immediately putting a story into that, aren't they? And I suddenly realized I was talking with a friend like this and I was explaining, yeah, you do that, don't you, with empty houses? And they all looked at me completely blankly and I realized not everybody does this. And maybe this is what's the difference between people who write stories and what isn't. Welcome, Val. Do you think as a short story writer, are you forever always having ideas because you chance upon them in that way? In a way, I think you're right. Um... I have ideas wandering about. I mean, I'm somebody who wanders about the community um, or just the streets, to be honest. But in <laughs> library books, uh, in libraries, things like that, I tend to see things, write them down. And they don't necessarily go into anything for years, but they do eventually <laughs> appear in a novel or a short story. And how's about you, Paul? I mean, I know that, you know, it, it, in your um, most recent one, it definitely comes off a whole series of, of things. But is it that sort of, is that a story making brain? If, if, if Is there such a thing? I, I think what happens to me is a bit like with Val. I will I will chance upon a situation or overhear a story or maybe read, maybe read a small news item or something. And it'll just stick, stick in my brain and, and I'll keep coming back to it. And it may not turn into, into a story or a novel sort of very quickly, often it'll just take for quite a long time. Um, or it'll be something that really happened to me on encounter or a person that I met that I just thought, I wonder what their life is like behind closed doors or something like that. And then and then the sort of the fervid imagination takes over then and then you just, yes. then you just sort of, <laughs> and then you start projecting all the sides of yourself you want to explore on the page while hiding behind other characters. <laughs> yeah, that's it exactly. <laughs> But Neil, you're a journalist, mm. and journalists pick up loads of stories. Um, do you find, though, that with the kind of stories you do, that some of them just aren't reducible to fiction, if you know what I mean? I think, yeah, especially at the moment, because we're living in a world that's so extreme that if you'd written this as a synopsis and given it to your editor six months ago, they probably would have laughed you out of the, out of the office. Um, there are some things that, as Paul said, um, there are things that you want to explore in your work. There are real life instances and cases that you look at and you think, right, what triggered that? Where do I want to go? But there are some things that you just look at and say, you can't fictionalize that. I mean, look at this just now. Look at, you know, um, look at the amount of times that people have tried to write something about a megalomaniac who seizes control of the biggest nation on the planet. And then, uh, you know, people, you know, Tony Kent's written a very, um, prescient book about that and you know the corridors of power and the corruption that goes on um but you know how could you trivialize sorry how could you, trivialize, how could you fictionalize what's going on now um so there are some things that you hit and you just say no can't touch that yeah i think readers readers that have a point where they just say God, that wouldn't happen yeah even when you know as a journalist it has happened yeah and it's that odd thing you've got to make them a, a you've got to make a believable world haven't you yeah um um, so how are you all finding writing? I know I spoke to Paul a bit about this when I spoke to you a couple of weeks ago, Paul, but, but um, Val, are you, are you managing to write? I'm writing very little at the moment. I'm editing a novel. I normally write comedy or a lot of comedy, and I'm writing a, editing a more serious novel. But um, I'm also trying to just do some comedy on my Facebook page every other day 
to keep people cheerful, but also it keeps my hand in at, at comedy. Right. So um, I have an Auntie Val persona who is an extremely unpleasant agony aunt. <laughs> so quite on the and agony. And cruel. <laughs> and um, that really, yeah, that's been my most enjoyment these last few weeks. Being yeah, horrible. Funny, I, I am terrified that people aren't going to want crime books because they're just going to want sort of um, nice nice things to happen in what they read i can see a lot of um a lot of um pg woodhouse being sold at the moment or something like that but anyway um how are you finding writing neil i'm very much like val i'm in the lucky position at the moment that i managed to sneak the next corner freezer book in just under the wire of this happening so i'm on edits at the moment which is lucky because whenever i've tried to fix my mind onto writing about something a my concentration shot because of what's going on and b one of the things that I'm struggling with, which I'm assuming a lot of writers are struggling with, is if I'm writing a contemporary novel that's going to come out a year from now, how do I reflect what's happening now in that book when I have no idea, nobody has any idea, what the world's going to look like six months to a year from now? It's even hard writing crowd scenes at the moment, yeah, isn't exactly it? Yeah, exactly. You, know, you can't stand there. Move apart. Yeah, I mean, the, the last, you know, No Place to Die, features a weekend retreat for a self-improvement weekend where there's a couple hundred people milling around in crowds and i'm thinking about that now going well that wouldn't happen at the moment and you know i'm doing the edits for the next one and again there's scenes where connor meets his dad in a pub and you're thinking well that you know so it's strange because we're writing stuff that reflects the world that we're living in now but the world that we're living in now is such a bizarre place how do you write that and i've not got my head around that problem yet how did you come up with the character of connor because it's different when I mean, your first series mm -hmm. you know I, you could see a sort of mm -hmm. continuity between yourself and but, but this is this is somebody who's a, a an xp um sni officer yeah um from a i presume quite a different experience to yours i don't know tell i mean but, but maybe differently where did you come up with him from again it was one of those things where just the pieces of the puzzle started to fit together when I got the idea for um, the start of No Man's Land and the decapitated body, I quickly came to the recognition that there was going to be some pretty extreme violence in this book. And I wanted somebody who was unlike Doug in the first series, someone who was very physically capable, who would be able to handle firearms, who would be trained in self-defense, who would be trained in deductive techniques. And I looked around and thought, who would get that training? The only people who are standard police officers who are given firearms training in the UK or Northern Ireland. Ah, hold on. And I spent a summer when I was studying in Belfast, so I knew the area quite well. Yeah. And then it just kind of gave it the germ of the idea from, right, okay, I've got a guy who spent time, he's half Irish, he's got, he's been in the PSNI, he's left the PSNI for some reason, which we'll get into in no man's land. He comes back, what was a guy who's an ex-cop do? He'd go into private security, okay. And then, so it was a kind of progressive thing was, he didn't kind of pop into my head whole and complete. I kind of got to know him through circumstance because I needed somebody who was like that. And then I just started filling in the gaps and then he started filling in the gaps as I went. I like the way they do that. Yeah, that's brilliant. Um, so Paul, um, onto, onto Polari for a while, if I can. You know, th this has been something you've done now for years and it's about bringing people together in a room, in yes. libraries and theatres and all that stuff like that. You can't do that right now. No. Um, how does that feel and how much have you had to to, to cancel? Well, we've had to cancel a few already because we, we, we're officially on tour. We started our, our tour um, two weeks ago, <laughs> officially, and but it continues until next spring. So there's time to delay. So several events have been, have been delayed. Um, some have been cancelled, unfortunately, which is inevitable, but we'd have to do other, other, other events in their place. It's all very timely because this year is the 10th anniversary of the prize that we run. And could, could I just stop? Actually, I'd better ask you to explain Polari a bit, you and yeah, Polari just... is a Polari is a live literary showcase for LGBTQ plus talent, and the prize is a is a book prize for books that explore those themes and characters. So it's about diverse publishing, and it's the tenth year of the prize this year. So we've had ten winners, and we've got two prizes now: our first book prize, and, and also a book for uh, a prize for non debuts. So this year we've, we're showcasing authors who've won previous years and also those that will be long and shortlisted this year. So it's all timed around the prize announcements. 
So I'm just hoping that things will get back to set well, as, as close to normal as they can be within the time frame before the tour ends, because obviously, you know, we've got quite a bit of leeway. Um, but we are doing some things virtually. We did um, Huddersfield Lit Fest. We did that as an online. We're doing um, a Polari on Sea, which is a regular event we do in Hastings, where Val lives and where I live part time. Um, that's on Thursday night. So we're doing that virtually on Thursday night. Yeah. Um, instead of doing it live at the print works, which is very sad because we love being at the print works. It's a lovely venue and a lovely audience, but sadly we can't do that. So we'll do that one virtually. And then I've got plans to do similar ones, you know, as and when we need to, and then to push back the rest until such a time as we can do them, deliver them live to an audience. On, on that, you know, I mean, as Neil was saying, it's making us think about how we do stuff. Now, the great thing about Polari is it really is bringing people together. And, you know, started at a time when 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 actually that was a community that almost needed bringing together. Um, and you can't do that in the same way. Is there are there any upsides to doing it online? Are you finding the only up, well, there, there, there are upsides in the sense that you, you can reach people who can't geographically get to you, obviously, oh. because they can access you online. Um, not everyone, of course, is online. And I mean, and, you know, in Hastings, many of our regulars, because I know from the bookings, they don't book online. They they, they 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 like to book in person, so they, they maybe don't they're not as online as often as maybe we are. So there's that sort of downside. But the catchment is bigger, obviously. So you yeah. you you're gonna you're gonna reach people that you wouldn't normally um, speak to. And also, I mean, in in the past, I've had people say to me, "What? Why don't you do a podcast? Why don't, why don't you do this so we can watch it from listen listening from America and so on?" I just haven't had the time to do anything like that. I've been too busy putting on live events. But yeah. now it's making me rethink all of that. Like, what if, if you're going to do a live event, find some way of recording some or part of it, if not the whole event, that you can then use to, to, to share with people beyond that immediate audience in the future. Because I think that's a really important part of what we're doing as storytellers, is to spread the story as widely as possible and to share it with, with as many people as possible, whether it's readers, listeners, viewers. You know, I think it's all part of the challenge of being a writer these days. Um, Val, you're, you're, I just should mention your book, and I'd love to fit it on screen, but I'm only allowed four pictures on screen. Actually, I'm going to I'm going to bump Neil just for a second. Neil, you'll come back. I'm just going to show. Oh, you've got it there. <laughs> come, back, come back, Neil. I was going to show it here. You see. <laughs> um, let me just hold on, Neil. Come back. Here you go. Um, right. Um, and we change position. That's great. I must do that more often. Um, so as a writer, do you remember the first time you got involved in Polari? And tell me what it does for writers. Um, it's fantastic for writers because it does give them a chance to read in front of an audience and get a real sense of how people feel about their work. Generally, a good feeling. Um, and it, it introduces them within a, the Polari setting, their work to people who wouldn't perhaps have bought their books. Um, Sometimes people wouldn't buy mine, they would assume they're for women, but they're not only for women. And doing a Polari, um, there's men, women in the audience, and they often buy my book. The first time was, um, it was in a club. I, was it, was it, I don't remember what the club was called, Paul. Well, we were part of a stalker's night. Oh my God, that was at Freedom Bar. <laughs> another spashing author, Karen McLeod. Oh, Karen. Um, it was very glamorous and, and I was less than glamorous, um, but whatever. Uh, and it was just a lovely evening and I'd never done anything like that before right. and was very, very shy and anxious, but um, it was just brilliant. Everybody, it just seemed a very strange thing at the time that there was this club full of people listening to, to music, um, drinking, and then quietening down to actually listen to people reading from their books, which is fantastic. And Oh You Pretty Things, a collection of short stories. And I have to ask about the cover, if you can hold it up. Is that you? That was me, it, yes, in, in my early 20s. That's very glamorous. I love so, that uh, cover. It's a, great, it's a great cover and a great shed behind you. And you know, <laughs> apart from the hair much longer, it, it's very similar to me now, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> but I... I Neil, are you missing events? Yeah, I mean, the camaraderie of them, you know. Yeah, the th 
I once heard crime festivals described as office parties, but with people you actually like working with. That's such and, a good action. You know, that's I can't remember who said that. I think we're all half cut at the time, but um that's what I miss is you know, you get this is great, but you do miss one of the things about festivals is not just connecting with the audiences, you know, people saying nice things about your work, which is always nice, and people actually buying your books, which is even better. But it's getting to meet up with your pals because the crime writing community is very close. You know, and I had this all set up that we would be going to Newcastle, um, obviously Harrogate, bloody Scotland, which we don't know is going to if it's going to go ahead. And you get to meet your pals, and I'm missing that aspect of it. My liver is thanking me for the break. Um, it has to be said. Uh, but no, I, I do miss kind of getting out there and getting to meet your, you know, meet your friends and see where everybody's going, swap notes, that type of stuff. Um, Hugo says he thinks he's got a photograph from that moment. From that <laughs> moment. I think that's probably, what year was oh, that? Yeah, that was... As somebody who's completely football averse myself, I have to say. Uh -huh. I have a in the background. I think that was 20... Hold on. First one came out 2018, 2019. It's 2029. Yeah, it must have been 2017. Right. Um, and I, I remember the moment because I remember Chris Brookmeyer had kicked a ball and there was this massive thumping noise from it as there is because the acoustics in that place. And there was a shout and it just suddenly, for whatever reason, that just suddenly thought, oh, I could put a body there. But yeah, I think that was about three years ago. And the funny thing was, again, my now publisher... I'd set up a meeting with her, or sorry, my agent more accurately, I'd set up for me to go for the drink with her. And she was really interested in publishing me, but she couldn't take me mid-series with Doug and Susie. Mm -hmm. So that night after I'd come up with this rough idea, she sat down, gave me a drink and said, right, I'd really want to do something with you, but I can't do you mid-series. Have you got anything else? As it happens. Well, well you know, after I'd stopped giggling manically, as so happens, um, and then it just kind of went from there. So it was like most of the things that have happened in my publishing career, a very happy coincidence. Yeah. And what are you working on? What do you plan to do with the next book then? Um, the one that I'm just editing just now. Yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, the Point of No Return is basically another corner mystery. Um, about 20 years ago, two girls were snatched from Stirling University, mutilated, killed and dumped. A local bad guy was quickly identified as the suspect, tried, convicted, and sent away. Jump forward to today, and it's found that the conviction is unsafe, it's quashed, and he's released. He says he wants to go home to Sterling. Because obviously he's got hate crimes, against, sorry, there are threats, death threats against him from the local community. He wants security, but he doesn't trust the police with everything that happened, so step in Connor Fraser. No sooner does Connor step in than another body is found mutilated oh. in the same way as the victim from 20 years ago but how can it be the same guy if connor's his background and his alibi and then it all kind of unwraps from there and there's a subplot about connor's past that's been building up in the last two books um connor's past his relationship with his gran that he has to untangle at the same time now foul you've fallen into the bad company here because there's three crime writers in the box do you read crime yourself i do Particularly since I've known Paul, actually, because he, right. he passes me on anything that he thinks is really good. And to be honest, I, I absolutely love crime. I find it fascinating. Um, I'm, I feel the genre has rather taken over the world, which is, yeah. is good for, for the writers of, of crime. But um, so some I like better than others, but it's still a very, very exciting um, I like to think we're keeping publishing afloat for everybody else. Sorry? I like to think we're keeping publishing afloat for everybody else. We certainly are keeping publishing afloat. And it is, and from, from what I've heard, the actually the crime writers are a very supportive they are. Uh, set yeah. of people in the yeah. main. They really are. No, it's extraordinary. It's fantastic. For a late career myself, I've never worked with a, ni with a nicer bunch of people, to be honest, or more supportive, or learnt as much as I have done yeah. from them. Yeah. It's very so strange. Yeah. Um, but it's not, it's a non-competitive industry, which is really, the, the penny drops that just because, just because Neil sells a hundred more books doesn't mean I sell a hundred less. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and so we're all in this together. And, you know, it's, it's a lovely bunch of people to stumble on, really. 
Um, a couple of questions here. Andy is determined to ask why I'm dad and who his mum is and why. So you're going to have to you are going to have to unpack this anecdote. Do I, do I really have to explain the birds and the bees to my dad? It's quite embarrassing. This <laughs> um, this goes back to oh god, 2016, 2017, Harrogate. Uh, you know Harrogate. Everybody just assembles at the Swan, and I was there with another writer called Lucy Cameron. And we were just talking away and we fell into the company of Andy, who was talking to Zoe Sharp. And they kind of adopted us over the course of the weekend. We went out for dinner, went for drinks, got inordinately drunk, um, as you do at these events. And they just kind of adopted us as mum and dad. Uh, and that's been it ever since. And apparently I'm the favourite child, but mum's got a particular set of skills. So I've got to be very careful with what I say. My mum is Julie Sharp. You know what she writes, so you yeah. Know what yeah. yeah. <laughs> Can I say that there does seem to be a lot of drinking vibes at these two <laughs> these events? Everybody seems to have a story of when I woke up the next morning, or God knows where I was at the end of the evening. <laughs> the worst I have ever been is my first novel, Falling Fast, got nominated for the Dundee International Book Prize back in 2014. And in 2015, I was asked back and my agent was doing the photography for the event. So we went to the dinner and the drink was basically flowing freely. Next morning, I woke up and I think I was still drunk, but I did this event, did the panel, and I was just about getting away with it when the Dundee University folk, ah, this is John from the literary department. They want to do an interview with you about literary theory and your book and everything. So for the next hour with me, with my brain leaking slowly out of my ear, um, I was questioned about that narrative perspectives, story art, characters, <laughs> narrative styles, and oh, and I just, I, I honestly wanted to weep. It's the worst hangover I've ever had. Well, it's not the worst hangover I've had. That was Harrogate after an afternoon with Derek Farrell and Ed James. Um, <laughs> that was a lovely process. What happens is you get invited to a festival and you get very excited, and then they tell you your panel is nine o'clock on Sunday morning. <laughs> yeah. Oh, God. Yeah, there's going to be nobody there at all, and anybody who has, was there last night and just hasn't gone home to bed yet. Yeah. In fact, we did one in Stirling, Paul, I think Sunday morning about 11 o'clock, yes. and it was in quiet. People were very respectful, let's yeah. put it that way. Yeah. Um, Derek wants to know... Um, how much of your plot for um, The Closer I Get, which is Paul's last novel, this brilliant novel, um, how much was plotted in advance and how much came on the fly? Um, I knew I knew the sort of broadest strokes in advance. So I knew that the main character, Tom, was going to leave London and escape to Hastings. Um, I also knew... Oh, <laughs> bless you. Do my bit. <laughs> I also knew that um, there was going to be... Um, a twist. I wasn't sure what the twist was going to be, um, but a lot of it really came. It, it sort of it sort of grew out of the characters because I, I the characters kind of took over a bit as, as as I was writing, especially Evie because her voice is so persistent, the the stalker character, um, and she led me up alleys I I wasn't expecting to go up, put it that way, and um, then then I sort of by the sort of last sort of when I, when when I was two, two thirds of the way, three quarters of the way through, then I kind of knew how it was going to end. Then, but the, but I, I, I didn't know the ending when I started out. I, I, I never do, and I was I always have a rough idea of I want the character to to be in a very different place to where they were at the start, or I want for there to be some lesson learned or or whatever. But I don't know what it's going to be. I, I very rarely know that until when I start writing a novel. It's it's a it's a journey of discovery for me. So I just, I just know some of the basics, you know, some of the broadest, solid things about what the setup is, what the flaw in the character is going to be that's going to create this problem for them. Um, but beyond that, I don't really know much until I get there. I feel my way. Very good. Well, I've, I've been looking at the clock ticking on my right, and I see we're just coming up to 30 minutes, which is about where I like to draw it to a close. And obviously, people would oh love to stay on for longer, but I think 30 minutes is probably about right for a, a Facebook video. So I'm going to bid you all uh, goodbye and thank you very much for spending that time with me. I just want to say tomorrow, um, I have Val McDermott uh, talking about the Homeless World Cup um, with um, um, Mel Young, who's the founder of the Homeless World Cup. Right. Uh, so that's obviously a huge one. And can everybody please spread that and join in? That'd be fantastic because um, it's great to get Val on. Uh, so thank you so much, Neil, thank Paul, you. Val. 
um, for this afternoon and good luck with it all. Um, and us. see you on the other side in, in, in the flesh at some point, I hope. And meanwhile, there's a message for everybody. <laughs> uh, hold on, wave it up and down just so I can read it. My spot. I'm noting. That's, that's our message for today. For today. And Sarah Palmer. Thanks so much. Sarah Palmer. Is that the Sarah Palmer who who just uh, sent me a Facebook message about um, your your um, mind stuff? If so, I'll plug that tomorrow. Um, that's brilliant. There's a, a, a writing competition that you're do doing, which I haven't had a chance to look at properly, but I will do. Thanks a lot. Goodbye, Thank everybody. Lovely to meet you, William. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Take care. Bye. Bye.